since well, wasn't the, the weather change been wonderful? Oh, and by the way, for I got a big sign here. Let me tell you how bad it's getting in my life. Stand up, Patty. Patty now has note cards for me. All my jokes are now going to be on that card. So if they're not any good, you can blame her. Just kind of make your way. We're, we're doing things a little different. So if you're with the ages K through 5, Miss Stephanie is here. Why don't you come up and go with Miss Stephanie? Yes, to hear it from Miss Stephanie. She's going to go get them. Yeah. Awesome. Well, guys, hasn't it been a great day? It's been a little bit gloomy in the weather, but yet very cool and very fallish. And so we have much to be thankful for. We really have had a wonderful September as far as I'm concerned. It's been warm, hot, and the way I like it. Because we know it's coming. Cold and damp. You're going to have cold days like this, so we need to be thankful. Well, we've been in a series called The Game of Life. You know, life, we, we liken life. It's not really a game, but we sometimes play it like it's a game. And we certainly use that metaphor to describe life. And we've been in this series, we started last week, just dealing with life issues that all of us have to deal with. And one of the things I love about the Bible is that it is so relevant to our lives. So last week, we, we began the game of life looking at, at um, making life decisions about college or career. Just tonight, we want to talk about marriage and relationship and community. And I want to start with a story that I came upon recently, and it's, it's called, it's a story about Jake Porter, who loved football. He played for Northwest High School in McDermott, Ohio, but Jake had a disorder called chromosomal fragile X, which means he is cognitively challenged. However, Jake was committed. He showed up every day for practice. He ran through every drill, dressed for every game, but knowing he'd never play. In the last game of his senior year, the coach wanted to get Jake in the game. And so he and the other coach agreed before the game that if the game got lopsided, Jake would play. With five seconds to go, losing 42 to nothing, Coach France called a timeout. At the moment, the coach of the other team, he ran across the field, and, and Coach France was concerned that he had changed his mind about letting Jake come into the game. But the other coach said, we just don't want Jake to play, we want him to score which would mean that his team would lose their shutout. And Coach France objected, saying, we have practiced all week long teaching him how to take a knee. To which the other coach resp responded, you give him the ball, we'll make sure he scores. But don't take my word for it, watch it for yourself. Isn't that awesome? Yes, give a round of applause. That's awesome. Now, what does that have to do with the game of life and our series? It has everything. You see, because winning alone is called losing. When I heard, read this story weeks ago, I, I read it several times, and every time I would read it, tears would come to my eyes. Because, folks, that's what life's about. There are going to be things out there and situations that you're going to be Jake, and other times you're going to be this winning team. All of us are at the top in some things and at the bottom of other things. But when it really comes down to everything in life, it comes down to people and relationships. You know, I was sharing this week with some folks about business. We were talking about some business things, and I said, you just need to remember that you're not in that business, you're in the people business. Whether you're a restaurant business, whether you're selling like her father, Patty's father sold, sold uh, welding stuff for years, her brother sells medical stuff, it doesn't matter what you're selling, you're in the people business. We're in the people business. Everything's about people. Relationships is what it's all about. And so tonight I want to talk to you about playing the game of life with others. You see, if we win at the game of life, but we win alone, it's actually 
losing. You know, I, this is so important that I did some, some study and some reading to just kind of drill down on. I came upon a quote from psychologist Philip Zimbardo of Stanford. He writes, I know of no more potent killer than isolation. There is no more destructive influence on physical and mental health than isolation of you and me and us from them. You see, winning alone is called losing. And so one of the first things that we have to do when we decide to live life and play the game of life is not just choose college and career as we saw last week, but we really have to learn how to keep score. We have to learn what really is important. And the first thing that's important is people. Now, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about marriage tonight, but it's not just about marriage. And I, and I don't want us to get sidetracked just on marriage, but I want to read from the book of Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 24. When God created the world, he created man first, he created Adam first, and then he created woman after that. And it, the story picks up in chapter 2, verse 18, when it says this. And the Lord God said, it is not good, not good. Now, you're going to hear the words good for me for the next year until ad nauseum, because those seem to be the words. I was doing some study for a, for a, a sermon a couple weeks from now, and I kept falling under the words, do good, do good. It's everywhere I look now. It's do good, do good, do good. But God says here, and he had said seven times in chapter one of, of the book of Genesis, when he created the world, it is good. And the last time he said it's very good, now God says it's not good. So something's wrong, something's missing. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. Did we not just read from the guy from Stanford, being alone is not good for us. We need people in our lives. We don't need sometimes everybody who's in our life, but we need people in our lives. I will, be, I will make him a helper comparable to him. And so out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air, and he brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called them, each living creature, that was its name. And so Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took, this is the first surgery, by the way, and he took one of the ribs and closed up the flesh in its place, closest to his heart. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man and said, and, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, man shall leave his father and mother, and they shall become one flesh. The first thing I want to say to you tonight, tonight is that the decision that young people have to make or single people have to make it no matter what age is whether we're going to marry or not get married. And I want you to understand that the decision to marry or not marry is not the decision of whether we will do life alone or not. You see, when God made Eve, he was doing more than making a wife for her, from him. Let me get that right. Today's world, you might need to edit the tape. God was doing more than just giving him a wife. God was creating community. You see, because from Eve, after he married Eve, and they had children, then they had children. So now you have a family. And then after so many years of having so many kids, because they lived a long time and, how, and their families got big, then their families turned into a clan. A clan is several families. And then their clans turned into tribes. And then their tribes turned into nations, and the nations turned into a world. So the decision to marry or not marry, I want to get straight from the beginning, is not a decision that is, I'm going to do life alone, play the game of life alone, but if I get married, I'm going to do it with somebody. That is a false representation of what was happening here. You see, winning alone is called losing. Now, deciding to marry or not marry is a whole different decision. Do you want to marry? Do you not want to marry? That's just an individual thing. And so you don't have to get married to play the game of life with others. So for the single people out there tonight, let me, let me just encourage you. You can have community. And I'll share in a few moments a little bit deeper about that, but I just want to encourage you that we don't have to be married. In fact, 
I have had to counsel many people over the years that were married and still isolated and alone. And it's not automatic. And we have to work at this thing of inviting people into our lives and learning how to do life together with a number of people. I am convinced that sin destroys community, it destroys relationship. Sinners don't make for good mates, they don't make for good friends, they don't make for good church members. Sin destroys community. And that's why God deals with sin, not because he hates us having fun, it's because he knows sin will destroy us and our relationships. You don't have to get married to play the game of life. And I would like to share a story with you. Max Dupree was a great CEO years ago. He's about 95, 96 years old now. But he was a great writer and a great businessman and a great leader. When he was 95, 96 years old, his, actually Max Dupree is, is talking about his father. His father was 96 years old. He went to his father and his father told him this. His father said, I've lived too long. I've outlived everybody I know. It's a hard thing, he said, to outlive all your peers. And I don't have any friends. And so Max, Max Dupree is the famous CEO and writer, he asked his father, he said, don't you have anybody, Dad? And he told Max about his one friend who was eight years old, an eight-year-old neighbor. And so he told him the story of how they met. The boy had no father. He had no real role model in his life. But on his path from home from school, he would pass by Max's father's house. A relationship started one day when Max's father saw him and the boy, and he nodded to each other, and the nods turned into hellos, and hellos turned into conversations. And after a while, the boy got in the habit of stopping by two or three times a week on his way home from school. Max asked him what they would do when the boy would come over, and so he said, I'd fix a glass of milk and a plate of cookies just in case he was going to stop by and visit. And what he did would sit and eat the cookies out on the stoop so that everyone could see what we were doing and no one had anything to worry about. And so Max writes, then the loneliness of a 96-year-old widowed world-class CEO, because his father was one as well, and the loneliness of an 8-year-old fatherless boy melted away. You see, because Max understands that winning alone is called losing. Folks, people are lonely in our culture. We've got children without fathers and mentors. We have mothers without husbands to help raise kids. We have husbands without wives One of the greatest needs that we have today in our community, in our church, in the church, very here, as we gather, maybe even here tonight, and we gather tomorrow when there'll be hundreds of people here, the isolation and loneliness for me is palatable. I can feel it. And God wants us to do something about it. You see, we all inherently know that winning alone is called losing, but we don't know how sometimes to reach out. Or we've been hurt And we're afraid to be a friend again, or we're afraid to love again, we're afraid to marry again. And those those fears keep us isolated like a moat around a castle. And yet we know that we need one another. Folks, it's hard to be in relationships. People, friendships and business and marriage and people are our greatest asset, but sometimes it can be the greatest liability. People sometimes can be just a pain in the butt. Amen? You know, I was talking to a couple earlier tonight and... I said, now you can't tell Patty this, but I'll start with this. I said, if you ask Patty, she would tell you at times I'm downright annoying. No. (laughs) And I would never say this publicly, but, you know, Patty sometimes, no, she's not annoying. I'm just selfish. Folks, I'm not saying that relationships are always hunky-dory and when you're in a relationship that's healthy that it's always romance and fire and fireworks. But we need people. Now, I started this message this way because I want to talk about singleness and marriage. But I want to start out by laying a foundation that what I'm saying here is that marriage is not the answer to what is really needed. Marriage is just one aspect of community. And we got a number of single people today 
that need to be encouraged in their singleness. And we've got a number of married people that need to be encouraged in their marriedness. But what I would say to all of us is that we all need to begin to open our hearts and enlarge our hearts to allow other people in. Now, I've said for years around here, you've got to do that carefully because people can hurt you. And so I say, look behind the door before you get in a relationship with people. But when I think of this eight-year-old boy, and I think of kids, I, with my wife and I went to a chamber meeting, chamber of commerce meeting, I need to clarify that, chamber of commerce meeting uh, this week, and we're just going out and, and into the community now and just meeting with people and finding out what the needs are in the community. And we met two people that are doing something in the community. One guy is, is growing mustaches so they can support children with disabilities, and then what a disability, what a disability that we're supporting, Pat. Do you remember what the calls was? I met so many that I'm, try, I'm mixing stories. But another person was just getting buddies for people that were handicapped. And I thought this is awesome. And, and, and as we're getting, because what, what I'm doing as a pastor, I'm going out into our community and saying, okay, what are the needs? And there's lots of needs. And then I wanna, I'm praying, God, what needs do you want us to fulfill as a church? How can we just love on people? How can we just do good to people? How can we help eight-year-old boys to have role models? Because winning alone is called losing. But one of the decisions that we have to make in the game of life is whether we'll be married or not. And so I wanted to remove that stigma right from the start that we have to get married to play the game of life with somebody else. But it is a big decision because the Bible says so. Now, I'm going to ask you for homework tonight. I know you don't like homework, but I'm going to give you some homework tonight. I want every one of you to read in your Bibles. And if you don't have a Bible, if you'll see me after the service, we have some Bibles here. We can give you a Bible. But I want you to read or listen to on tape 1 Corinthians chapter 7 because I don't have time to read the whole thing. And if I start reading it, I just want to expound on everything. And we won't get out of here until 10, 11 o'clock. And so... Star Trek comes on at 9, so i got to get you out of here by 9. But Paul says here several things about marriage and singleness. First of all, staying single is a viable option. Doing life alone is not. And that's what I want us to understand. And that's not the decision we're making if we decide not to get married. But singleness is a viable option. In fact, verse 7 of chapter 7, Paul calls singleness a gift. He says, for I wish that all men were even as I myself. Now, what he's talking about there is that he was single. And he said, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner, another in that. And so singleness can be a gift. Some people are gifted to be single. I, I remember when I was 19, 20 years of age, my fear was that I was gifted to be single. And the reason I thought that is I couldn't get a date on Friday nights. And I feared, I literally feared that I'd live alone. In fact, I remember I went up to become a priest at one point when I first got saved. And my fear, because for years I'd run from God because I felt the call of God and I was raised Catholic and the only thing I knew was the priesthood. And I wanted no part of that. But when I got saved, radically saved, I said, God, I'm even willing to be a priest. And I went up to, to, I went to the diocese and I actually applied to become a priest. Some people don't know that. I am so glad. Now there's days, Patty wonders if I missed my calling. But for some, singleness is a gift. And I really wish the Catholic Church would do that on an individual basis. It would solve a lot of problems. Singleness in verse 26 and verses 32, let the scripture lets us know that singleness has its advantages. He says in verse 32, he says, but I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And you could add there, how you may please your husband. So singleness actually has its advantages. But singleness has its disadvantages. And so it's a viable option, but we really need to look when we're making decisions, which one do I choose? And I remember being single. I remember being feeling alone. And I remember saying, I want to be married, but I didn't have any options at the time. So I just began to pray, and I just want to encourage those who are single as I would not compromise. I would not settle. I had plenty of opportunities really to date. But the reason I didn't date is they weren't godly girls. And for somebody out there, I just want you to know, I chose not to do anything wrong by not getting in the back seat. The best way to avoid temptation is not let it even go there. 
And so I was very selective on dates. I think I might have had three dates from the time I was 18 to the time I met Patty. I'm not exaggerating. But I had many opportunities to pick girls up. You understand? I wasn't half bad looking back then. I know it's hard to believe. Many times people want to go out, but I said, no, I'm, I, want to, I want to live for the Lord. And you have to get that selective. So I met Patty, and then it was all over. Another one bit the dust. But in verse 9, the Bible talks about marriage and one of the benefits. This is an advantage of marriage, but it's also a disadvantage of not being married. It says in verse 8, but I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them that they remain, remain even as I am. He's saying, hey, it's good for them, the widows, uh, to remain unmarried. Now, this is his bias. This is Paul's bias. This isn't from the Lord. Paul's saying, my opinion, I want everybody single because I'm single. And Paul's one of those guys, whatever he's doing is the best thing. You ever meet people like that? You know, if they drive a pickup truck, everybody should buy a pickup truck and drive a pickup truck. Paul was that kind of personality. I just hate to tell you, sometimes we deify Paul, but Paul wasn't Jesus. Paul had strong opinions, and sometimes, and I can prove this, he was wrong. Oh, boy, I just was a heretic on that one for some people. He was wrong on this one. It's good for you to be married if you're supposed to be married. It's good for you to be single if you're gifted to be single. Because he says in the next verse, but if they cannot contain, if they cannot exercise self-control, you know what I mean, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So the disadvantage of being single is you have nobody to help you with the temptations that our world throws at us. That's a huge disadvantage. Unfortunately, we're living in a world now that says you don't have any boundaries. I'm going to talk about this in a few weeks. We don't have any boundaries. You can do whatever you want, but I'm here to tell you it's ruining people's lives. Now, getting married is also a viable option, but it's not the only option, but it is a viable option. Because winning alone is called losing. Now, marriage has its advantages. First of all, I always have a date. Well, that's not true. There have been times Patty's turned me down. I say, you want to go to movies? No, I don't want to go to movies. You want to go out to dinner? No, I don't want to go out to dinner. Not with you, no. You're know, you going to make me pay again? You know. <laughs> but if you're struggling with temptation like I just read, and you get married, the advantage is you have somebody to help you. Now, now that's not automatic. I've had to coach couples over the years to, that you need to help each other in your temptation areas and with your wants and your desires and those things. So it's not automatic, but it is a help. If marriage is a viable option, if you're able to live with somebody the rest of your life. Let me say that again. Marriage is a viable option if you're able, not willing, able to live with the same person for the rest of your life because Paul says in verse 10, he says, not I, but the Lord. Now he distinguishes, he says, the wife or the husband is not to depart from the other. That's called divorce. God says marriage is for a lifetime. Now, if you've been divorced and people have been divorced, God can forgive that whatever part you played in that and he can move you on. Divorce happens. But the point is when you go into a new marriage, never go into a marriage thinking divorce is an option or I guarantee you, you will divorce. You have to go into it. I, I'm going to talk about the Lord's deal with me on covenant. People don't understand covenant. Marriage is a covenant. We have lowered marriage in our society, and we don't even know what it is anymore. Marriage is a life and death covenant. When I stood before the preacher, Woody, I committed everything in my life to this woman. I said, I will forsake all others. And that's how I live. I don't text other women. I don't go out to lunch with other women. Women, I don't want to offend you. If you ask me to go to lunch, my wife's got to go. I live paranoid. When I first came on staff here, they called me Paranoid Bob because Bob wouldn't, wouldn't socialize with women. Bob wouldn't hug women funny. Bob draws these, has drawn a circle around his life and said, nobody's in that circle but her. And when I'm tempted to look outside that circle... I get help. That's what you got to do. If you want to get married, that's how you got to live. I can't tell you the number of couples I've addressed in my life that have not drawn that circle and disaster happens. Because I'm here to tell you, living 
your whole life with one person is not easy. Just ask Patty. I love her to death, but she doesn't always do what I want. And she loves me to life. But I don't always do what she wants. And we have to talk about it and work it through. Marriage is a viable option, but understand what you're getting into. If you want to have children, marriage is the only way, guys. Now, you can have children outside of marriage, but it's hard. My heart breaks. It's one of the areas I just have a soft spot in my life for single parents. Ask my wife, male or female. It's difficult. You see why I get so aggravated about the marriage things that are going in our society is we're leading people to poverty. You know, I looked this up. I did some study. Thanks to the Great Recession, poverty in America has increased in the recent years. An organization called the Brookings Institution, which is one of those think tanks that is in Washington, D.C. Now, I know that you think as soon as they have Washington, D.C., nothing good can come out of Washington, but there's actually people in Washington that think they're just not in government. But they did a study. They whittled down. They did an analysis of the rules of how you can avoid poverty. Now, they're a nonpartisan group. They just looked at the facts and they, they boiled it down to three rules of how you can avoid poverty. Number one, graduate from high school. Number two, wait to get married until after 21 and do not have children until after you're married. Folks, this is not a Christian group. What I'm saying is marriage is a viable option. There's a circle called family. When we don't flow that way, it brings difficulties. And I ask you, I beg you, if you think about this, if you'll draw a circle around your life, sexually and financially and the things that I'm saying here, you will find that your problems come when things get outside of this circle. And every one of us has stepped outside this circle so nobody can condemn anyone else. I'm here to give you grace and mercy, but I'm also here to give you truth to help us to understand that we got to get our lives back in these circles that God has drawn. And then we got to go out into our community and we got to gracefully not condemn people for not living in the circle. We got to help them get back in the circle if they want their lives to be blessed. Man, I'm going to do a series on America. In about three or five weeks, whatever, I'm working on it. so many sermons right now, I don't know which one I'm working on. But you don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss it. You want to bring friends. I'm going to bless you. If people will listen to what I'm saying, people think, when I talk to people, I get tired of being right. I give you story after story where I've been right. I hate being right. But the only reason I'm right is I tell people what the book says. And I'm saying, if you want to be blessed... Follow the book. Don't follow Bob. Follow the book. Graduate from high school. Both of my sons married under 21. Selah. You think I was concerned? Absolutely. You think I said something? Absolutely. Did they listen? Absolutely not. Hear me, church. Do I still love them? Yes. Has it cost me money? Yes. I'm in poverty. Will they make it? Yes. Is it harder? Yes. Number three, have a full-time job. If you do those three things, you have a 74% chance of being in the middle class. And then I go outside the building, and people want to call me a bigot and a Bible thumper 
and intolerant. And all I'm trying to do is bless people. Marriage is an option if you want to have a family. This baloney that's out in our culture said you can do whatever you want. It started with Murphy Brown. And you know what happened to Dan Quayle when he messed with Murphy Brown? But I'm here to tell you. We've been on a downhill slide from there. And I ask you this question if you don't believe me. Are we better off than we were 30 years ago? You wait till I do the 30-year analysis since my wife and I. But I can't wait to do this sermon. This stuff is not a game. We call it the game of life, but it's not really a game. If you want to be married, you can be married. Verse 28 says, if you desire to be married, that's a good enough reason. And by the way, can I just say this? People have asked me, is romance, you know what I mean? Because there might be kids present. Is romance a good reason to get married? I say absolutely. It's just not the only reason. But it's a good reason. So if people are struggling with temptation, I heard recently nine, nine out of ten men in our churches in America are watching more porn and they're reading their Bibles. Folks, that's a problem. And marriage is one of the answers to deal with that. Folks, we need help. We're drowning in our culture. And yet we want to be blessed. I'm here to tell you, we can't be blessed if we don't listen to the blesser. Marriage is an option. It's a viable option. Singleness is an option. But if you can't be single and contained, then, God ha- then it's God's will for you to marry. Now you've got to find a mate. That's a whole other process. That's tough. We got to start making some mate worthy people around here. You think I'm being funny? I'm telling you, it's hard to find good people. That's why I had three dates in five years before I met Patty. Finally, if you're willing to put somebody else first in your life, then marriage is a good, good option. Now, how do you choose the right mate? You might want to sit down for this one. How do you choose the right person? Now, see, most of you here, I'm, I can't quite see because the lights are in my eyes, but a lot of you are married already. There might be a few single people here, and so I'm trying to balance this between... I, I want us to begin to elevate marriage again to what it was because it's a beautiful thing when it works right. But I'm here to tell you, there's nothing, like, there's nothing closer to heaven on earth than a great marriage, and I've got a great marriage. I, wa- I want to export my marriage. I want everybody to have what I have. I want everybody to have, I'm not bragging, I'm just saying I want everybody to have what I have because I've got intimacy, I've got, I'm happy with my, my marriage, I, I love my wife, she's my best friend, I'm never alone, I want everybody to have that, and I'm here to tell you it's not because we're good people, it's because this book works. You start doing what it says, it's amazing what happens. And that's the only reason why that we have a great marriage is we're striving to do this thing and when we get off course we confront each other. But how do you pick a great mate? How do you pick the right one? Are you ready? If you're single, write this down. You can only find out who the right one is when you know who you are. You can't pick the right mate. I'm sorry. I'll say can't. I'll give a money back guarantee on this. You can't. You're, you're throwing the dice if you pick a mate when you don't know who you are. And you're throwing a dice if you pick a mate who is not going to be comparable to you and like a puzzle piece fit with who you are and what you are shaped like. I can give you personal testimony on that, but I won't. You got to know who you are and where your life's going. And the number one thing you want to know about yourself is values. What's really important to you? What's really important to them? In fact, that's really the secret to all relationships. If you're going to have a harmonious relationship, the values, why do you think I preach so hard on certain things? Because if we don't get the right set of values, we will be divided and we will not be able to come together because we will value the wrong things and they'll lead to fights and wars. So you got to know who you are. Plato taught, Plato, the 
philosopher taught, know thyself. Polonius and Hamlet went on to say, and to thy own self be true. And the great philosopher Gilligan from Gilligan's Island said, I ask to be or not to be, that is the question that I ask of me. Remember that? Anybody remember that? Any Gilligan Island fans here? Just trying to lighten it up a little bit. In life, you're going to have to choose whether you're going to be single or married. And marriages fail, and so God wants to forgive and move on, but that doesn't mean he doesn't want you married again. But some people are meant to be single, and if you can handle temptation and you don't mind being alone and you really don't want to be encumbered with the, don't let anybody put pressure on you to be married. I remember getting out of high school. Man, first thing is, are you going to college? You're going to college, going to college. And it's after, after you go to college or you get established, it's when you get married, when you get married, when you get married. And then, then after you get married, when are you having kids? When are you having kids? When are you having kids? Would you just shut up and let me live my life? And they put pressure on you. Don't do that to your kids when you get married, when you get married, when you're going to have kids, when you're going to, don't do that. Because it really broke our hearts after my wife and I found out we couldn't have kids. How do you stay married? Or how do you fix a broken relationship? Let me give you an x-ray machine. See, our church values are an x-ray machine. These won't fail you. I've been trying these for five years now, and I'm telling you, they never fail me. You take these three values... You can x-ray your relation, every relationship you have, and you can find out what the bone is broken if there's a problem in your relationship. And if you follow these three values and things are going well, I guarantee you all three of these are happening well. Respect. Who are you valuing more, yourself or the other one? Let me tell you, i got to value my wife more than myself. I have to get up every day and I have to fight the tendency to put me first because I'm as selfish as everybody else is. And I'll get up in the morning, I want everybody, the world to revolve around me. I'm a type A, I would have everybody serving me. If I were God, you wouldn't have a chance. You think I'd be as gracious as God is? No way. I'd be zapping you. Show up five minutes late for church, zap. That evil thought you just had, when is he going to shut up? Zap! I didn't like what he had to say. Zap! A little dangle over the fire maybe a little bit. But who are you valuing more? I began to see this years ago when we were first married, when we got the seven-year itch, or I got the seven-year itch. I wasn't looking for anybody, but after seven years, I should say, when, how many years was it when we had kids? Maybe it's more like 10 years. I got a 10-year itch. Started having kids, and all of a sudden, all of our attention's going to the kids. I'm on the back burner. Come on, guys. I'm on the back burner. She's, she's changing diapers, running kids around the house. When I come home, her hair's sticking straight up. Looks like she got her fingers in an electric socket. And she says, here, take these kids. Well, hello would be nice. And I had to work through that. And I began to realize, you know, Bob, you need to understand, yeah, you've had problems on the job, but she's got problems at home, and she needs help, and you need to think about her more than yourself, because I'm like a whip dog. <laughs> Nobody cares about me. <laughs> you know some of you guys have done that. Come on. I'm just a meal ticket. My dad warned me, you get married, she just wants a meal ticket. That was my dad's advice. Don't get married, she wants a meal ticket. I said, Dad, she makes twice as much money as I do. I think I'm getting a meal ticket. I'm a lot smarter than you, Dad. You can see Harold saying that, can't you? That was my dad. He could make a sunny day cloudy. You want to buy a house, y'all be fixing it all the time. What, am I going to live on the street, Dad? Take the fun right out of it. And if you didn't do it his way, that was stupid. Somebody driving a red car and he likes yellow, that's stupid. That was my dad. Who are you valuing first? I beg you. In fact, I challenge you. If you'll go out of here today and say, I'm going to put other people first all in my life. You won't have a bad day for a long time. But you watch. When you're having a bad moment, it's all about us. Now, that's not always true. That's a little bit harsh. But I'm here. I challenge you to begin to live other-focused. I'm telling you, it will change your life. 
It changed my marriage. Patty didn't change a bit. It was me that had the problem. And I'm not saying we were having problems. We've never fought. But, but it's like, man, is this all there is to it? Watching kids, poopy diapers. Come on. Don't go out on dates. We didn't go out on dates for years. All the professionals said, you've got to go out twice a week with your wife. Go out twice a week. I have nobody to watch the kids. I don't have any money. Number two, responsibility. Are you, taking, are you looking at the log in your own eye first? Or are you looking at all the logs or specks in the other one's eyes? Now, I've taught you on this, but I'm here to tell you this will save your marriage. Or if you're, you're coming out of a bad relationship, in a bad relationship, and you begin to look at this, you begin to look at yourself, you can begin to diagnose yourself. If the other person doesn't want to change, you need to come see me. But when we begin to look at ourselves first, we begin to change. It's amazing what happens. And thirdly, relevance, which is learning how to communicate with each other. Learning, you know, I had to learn Patty's language. How, what does she, how does she think about things? Not just how do I think about things. And I had to learn to put things in. I'm still learning. Because people change. And she puts it in, in my language, and we're trying to learn to communicate. And then there's a group of people. You know, I spend as much time, it may not seem like it, trying to figure out how to say things to you as I do what I want to say. Because with everything I say, this person over here doesn't get it or they're offended. This person over here, oh man, it changed my life. This person over here is, I don't get you, Bob. Because communication is work. I promise you, if you'll do those three things, and really begin to hone in on them, you'll get an x-ray machine. Eventually, it's, remember those dotted pictures that came out about 10 years ago? Remember the dotted pictures that if you kind of stare at them a long time, like you begin to see things? Anybody remember that? Yeah, you stare at anything long enough, you're going to see something. I had a hard time with those. I, I, I had a hard time blurring. You had to blur your vision a little bit, but when you, it was got a 3D picture would come out. You know, you, people remember? I'm here to tell you, if you'll get a hold of the values we're teaching, respect, responsibility, relevance, one day, an image will appear to you, and it'll change your life. It's changed my life. It's changed my counseling. My pastoral counseling has totally changed in the last five years because of these. And it takes couples a while to get what I'm saying, because I keep drilling them on them. Well, okay, what if respect, responsibility? Can we move on? But no, I'm telling you, if you'll learn to do this, you go home and solve your own problems. Marriage is a viable option. Living, winning alone is not, because winning alone is called losing. And if we're going to be in relationship with one another, we're going to have to begin to drill down on the things that we've been teaching you. We're going to have to learn to put others first. We're going to have to begin to look at the logs in our own eyes, and we're going to have to learn how to communicate with each other. When we have problems, we're going to have to learn as parishioners. See, what drives me nuts, and I'll finish up on this is I've been in church a long time. What happens is this group of people have a problem with this group of people, so this group leaves and that group leaves. And they go to another church, and for a number of years they're fine, and they have a problem with somebody, and they leave that church. Meanwhile, we've got a community that doesn't know how to relate to each other, and we've got to figure out how to show them, and it starts right here as we begin to learn how to become a real community and start doing life together. Father, I ask you to... Take the words that I've said and make them more than my words. And Lord, the things that I've said that were just not relevant or not helpful, I pray that you just block our minds and forget them. But those things, Lord, that really can help make a difference. Help us, Lord, to win at the game of life by winning together. In Jesus' name.